So from fish, the family, and now to mice. Um, Dr. Matt Simon is the study director at Jackson Laboratories Rare Disease Translational Center, a nonprofit resource with the goal of providing rare disease patients and families with a path from diagnosis to therapy at scale. He studied at the University of Rochester and earned his PhD in molecular biology from UNC Chapel Hill, Go Heels. And he works on mice models and cell cultures investigating mechanisms of DNA maintenance and cellular stress responses. Um, so full disclosure, I left some things out of his bio because they were words I could not pronounce. So take it away, Matt. Thank you, Jill. And thank you for again having me here today to talk to you about the work we're doing up at JAX to try to help you and families like your own um, tackle some of these difficulties that come along with rare diseases. So I'm gonna bring up my screen here really quick, provided the computers wanna play nice with us. All right. Okay. I think everybody can see this. Uh, so um, I represent the uh, Rare Disease Translational Center at JAX, which is a relatively new organization. Uh, with the uh, specific goals of uh, partnering with uh, patient foundations, biopharma and scientists globally to facilitate research into treatments for rare diseases. And how we go about doing that is we work with groups like uh, Jill's and the FAM Foundation, uh, talk about what type of mutations the patients have, and then using uh, that information to engineer specific mouse models uh, with the idea of generating therapeutics uh, tailored to these specific diseases in mind uh, from the inception. That way, once we have a, a mouse model working, we have a pretty good representation of how we can do treatments in that animal, and that will directly help translate to the clinic and kind of expedite the process of going from seeing things that we can correct in a mouse and then fast tracking them so that they can get into the humans and help the patients. And then, of course, we distribute a lot of these resources, such as the mouse and cell lines we generate from the mouse, to other uh, associated scientists and the general medical and research communities to help further the research into these uh, pathways and mechanisms that lead to uh, some of these clinical manifestations that we see in rare diseases and genes that cause, you know, uh, rare disease phenotypes. So, uh, in regards to FAM 177A1, or FAM as we're all calling it, due to that, you know, word salad um, and its associated disease. Um, so Jill and the FAM Foundation, uh, along with the help of uh, Ethan Perlstein, um, reached out to us and got us involved in this process. Um, and I'm going to kind of summarize here quick what we've already kind of heard from other folks uh, like Jennifer and Liliana and Jiman, as well as Barack. What we currently know about FAM is not a whole lot. We do know that it is associated with the Golgi apparatus. Um, it is well conserved across multiple species, as we've seen in zebrafish, humans, and as well as mice. So this kind of clues us in that it does play an important role of some kind. Otherwise, nature wouldn't keep making sure that it goes from one species to the next over the course of evolution. But again, as far as the protein itself goes, it's relatively a black box. We don't know too much about it. But fortunately, again, we do have um, the same gene in the mouse. So that means we can generate a model in the mouse uh, following some specific genetic approaches. And what we also know about FAM is that, of course, its loss of function uh, results in several different phenotypes that are highly penetrant, which is very useful for uh, my group because we like to use the um, phenotypes that we see or the way the disease manifests itself in the human. And that helps us figure out what we can look at in the mouse to make sure that our models look a lot like our patients. There's no point in necessarily generating a mouse model if it doesn't show uh, similar um, presentations of the deficiency for FAM that we see in the humans. We want to make sure that we can translate what we do in the mouse over to the human being. So as you can see, uh, we have some you know, pretty strong similarities between the human version of this gene and the uh, mouse version of this gene. And so um, at the Rare, Dran Rare Disease Translational Center, we have a general process on how we go about generating these models. We identify the patient mutations and figure out what would be the best way to represent these mutations in the mouse. 
And we also do this while anticipating uh, downstream use of genetic therapies, which are greatly expanding right now. And it's a pretty exciting field and that there are many ways that we can introduce um, corrective elements back into patients um, that will help restore functionality to uh, genes that are absent or not functioning pro properly. And then we go about engineering the mouse using uh, genetic modification. We can also generate iPSC lines from these animals for our um, cellular biology collaborators. And then uh, my major role is phenotyping and testing the therapeutics on our mouse model and seeing if we can actually get some strong, robust phenotypes to show up and then correct them. And then this information is done at a uh, pre-IND level, which is uh, preclinical. Basically, by providing this to the FDA and other regulatory agencies, it's usually strong, uh, well-curated uh, information that they're uh, usually really happy to have, and it helps expedite the process of moving into human patients. So I'm going to go over briefly uh, how we made the mouse. Um, so again, we kind of have a representation map of what we see for the human being up on the top here where we have one copy of the FAM177A1 gene. But in a lot of our mice, we have many different strains of mice, there's a kind of a curious duplication event that has happened at this particular locus where they don't have one copy, they have a couple of copies, plus a little pseudogene, which is that little tiny one on the far right bottom. It's not particularly functional, but it provides some challenges when we're trying to genetically engineer these animals to remove uh, the FAM177A and basically mimic the, um, the condition in the human patients. So we decided to look around at a couple of other mouse strains that we had to see if this duplication is ever present. And fortunately, uh, for convenience sake, we found that the FVD strain of mouse only has one copy. There's still a little bit of duplication within this region, but there's only one functional copy, much like we see in the humans. So we selected this strain to be the host for what we were going to do, which is to use CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which is just a uh, very precise genetic engineering um, technology to go in here and basically snip out the FAM177A gene. And we went about doing this, and this basically causes um, the whole gene to kind of fall away. And then the cell goes about repairing this and making a, um, a copy of this chromosome completely lacking the FAM gene. And this is roughly a pretty large deletion, about 14,000 base pairs of the genetic code are cut out in order to facilitate this. So we went about doing this and succeeded. Um, we have a really excellent team of genetic engineers up at JAX. Um, and this was done by Steve Murray's group and uh, his head on show, Steve Neeland. Uh, we call them the pair of Steve's, great fellows. Um, and so after doing this um, uh, molecular uh, editing in some mouse embryos, they then put it into um, the actual animals and we get our founder, screen, our founder uh, animals from this. So these are carrying the mutation that we made. We then go about um, some basic genetic cleanup. So we basically cross these animals to their host strain and we look for um, several things. And these are just um, housekeeping things that need to be done to make sure that the genetic model that we made um, is going to be effective for our downstream research purposes. So we look for germline transmission. This is to make sure that we actually got this um, um, edited uh, copy of the chromosome into a part of the body where it'll actually go from one generation to the next. And then we also start checking in the next generation to make sure that the animals at a heterozygous or carrying at least one mutant copy um, of, the, um, of the gene are viable, that there isn't any issues in the mice with having only one functional copy. And then from there, we finally get to the meat of it, which is seen once we make a homozygote animal, which is an animal that doesn't have any functional copies, they're carrying only our mutation copy, and make sure that they are viable, that they can actually you know, be brought to term and that the animals will develop um, into adults, uh, which I'm proud to say that uh, we have already passed this step. We do have viable mice, so which is fantastic. And we're on the last stages of this, which is just making sure that we see normal genetic things happening, that they're inheriting the, uh, um, the mutated allele at a normal frequency, which was mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, it's called Mendelian frequency. Again, you'd expect um, most individuals in the human population only occur one in four from two affected parents. So we want to make sure that happens in the mice as well. 
And so from here, um, we are moving into the next steps, which will be beginning um, phenotyping, which is basically looking to see if we see the same symptoms that we see in the patients showing up in our animals. And in order to do this, we subject our animals to a battery of tests. And uh, we've kind of broken it down into several different phenotype categories. So the first one here is neuromuscular. And I'm showing a representation at the bottom here. We don't just look at these animals at one point in their life. We like to look at them at multiple stages of their development. Because as uh, Jill and others uh, can probably tell you, this isn't just a static um, um, condition. Um, we, we're seeing that the children are showing changes in the clinical presentations that they have as they get older. So we want to track this in our animals as well. So one of the first things we're looking into um, would be muscle strength, neuromuscular function, and hypotonia. And we do this using a grip strength meter, which is basically just a simple little device that the animals latch onto a grid, and we pull on their tails and see when they will let go. And it kind of measures just how strong they are. We also look for ataxia and neurodegeneration uh, um, indicators, and this is done with a test called hind limb clasping. Typically, when you hold a mouse by its tail, it splays its back legs out under normal conditions. But animals that have um, ataxia or issues with uh, nerve communication tend to kind of clutch. They, they pull their little legs in and close to the body. So we can score that as well. We also use a pretty fancy machine called a tread scan to look at gait analysis. And we can basically watch um, the animal from below with a little camera and track how they're moving and ambulating. And we can see if there's any issues with how they walk or move around. And then lastly, for this particular category, we use a very standard assay known as a rotor rod to look at neuromuscular coordination and balance. This helps us tell if the animals can help coordinate their movements. And all of these tests are somewhat complementary to each other. They kind of tease apart multiple aspects of neuromuscular function and um, condition. So in addition to these, of course, we also like to look at behavior and cognition. So one of the assays we look at here is open field we basically let the animal run around unperturbed in a little arena. And this kind of measures the uh, activity, if there's any anxiety in the animal, and some exploratory behavior. This is a very standard test that kind of gives us a good idea if the animals are showing any physiological or neurological uh, divergences from a normal healthy animal. We also want to look at recognition and cognition via a novel object recognition test. So this is a pretty simple one where we put animals in a, in a box with a object, they explore it, and then we take them out, switch out the object and see how much they can recognize that there's something new in there with them. We also will be looking at light dark chamber, which measures anxiety of the animals. Typically mice don't like to be out in the light, they like to hide in the dark. So the amount of time the animal spends in the lighted chamber versus the dark chamber gives us a good idea if they're experiencing any anxiety like phenotypes. And then lastly, to explore social behavior and autism spectrum uh, phenotypes, we use what's called a three-chamber social approach, where the animal can basically choose between two chambers, one containing a, another animal and one containing a cage without an animal in it, to see if they prefer to interact with um, another mouse, which most mice are actually pretty social and prefer to do. And then lastly, we are focusing on a markers and morphology category. And here we start looking for more specific things uh, such that we could uh, analyze and pick up um, from the animals um, at a at closer to um, a molecular level almost. So one of them is to look for cataracts using a slit lamp eye exam, and this can also help us look for retinal degeneration. This is also very important for us to do for a lot of the behavioral assays I just mentioned are very important that the animals have vision in order to be able to run around and do their um, tests properly. We also are going to do blood analysis to look for any you know overt biomarkers and see if there's any alterations in immune cells. As uh, alluded to earlier by Jennifer and Nicole as well as others, um, the best lead we have on this gene is that it may be related to uh, immune function. So we want to see if there's anything uh, changing within the immune cells in our mice. We will also explore the seizure susceptibility of the animals. Um, mice typically are not as sensitive to um, seizures as humans are, even with the same um, genetic changes that would cause uh, seizures in humans. So we can use an ECT approach, which basically sees if they have any sensitivity to seizure-causing stimuli. 
And then lastly, we'll be doing some gross morphological analysis of the brain and other key tissues to see if there's any changes in the structures. As mentioned earlier, um, MRIs have kind of revealed that there are some changes in the white matter of the brain as well as, well as issues with myelination. So we can also try to capture that with our mouse as well. So that's kind of the summation of where we're at with our animal. So our current and future goals are, again, to characterize the mouse model, confirm the patient phenotypes. Again, we have them breaking these down into neuromuscular, behavior and cognition, markers and morphology. And lastly, we also track these animals out uh, longitudinally. We want to look at them progressively as they get older. And this helps us see how some of these phenotypes we do identify change with age and also helps us observe if there's any novel symptoms or disease progressions that occur. And this can be very useful as many of the patients are very young. And if we see something that happens in late life, it might be an indicator that we can then provide to keep track of for clinicians and families. We're also going to explore when we see onset of symptoms in these animals. That's part of taking them out and testing them over multiple different ages. Um, and we also plan to establish genetic therapy strategies and demonstrate proof of concept so that those can be moved into the clinic more rapidly. And again, our key outcomes here from that would be to establish this as a uh, strong model for the human patients, identify highly penetrant, reliable phenotypes and markers with a large range between them so that we can use them as kind of uh, roadmaps to our um, intervention testing to see if we're actually fixing uh, the phenotypes. And lastly, I'm just going to wrap up by thanking, um, of course, uh, Jill and everyone at the FAM 177A Research Fund, as well as Ethan, uh, for basically helping organize all of us together and really bringing this community together to kind of tackle this rare disease and helping come up with solutions uh, to help patients and help these kids. I also have to give a big shout out to Kat Lutz, who is the vice president of the Rare Disease Center, and uh, the whole project is uh, pretty much her brainchild. And we have a wonderful staff of folks there who help support all of the work that I'm currently doing in this endeavor, as well as Steve Murray's group, who are the uh, minds and brains and hands around putting together this mouse from the get go. And so with that, um, I will close out and I'll be happy to take questions. That was amazing, Matt. I cannot wait to get those mice phenotyped and learn, you know, how they, uh, what they can teach us about this disease. And uh, it's on my bucket list to take a field trip to Jack's. Did you see that picture? <laughs> that gorgeous camp. It's yeah. a good time to do so. It's very beautiful up here in Bar Harbor. Awesome. Um, looks like. Can I ask a question uh, of, of Matt? And thank you so much for the presentation. We are. We are also excited to see what mouse model will show. Um, the way you generated the mutation, I wonder how easy or, or would you need a different platform to generate conditional? Um, I'm particularly curious about having uh, tissue specific farm models in mouse because that's for us a challenge in zebrafish at the moment. So yeah, well, we do actually generate a lot of models using conditional alleles. Um, usually we do that when we have difficulties with the animals being viable. Um, oftentimes um, we see plenty of human patients who have um, rare diseases or genetic mutations that you know still allow them to live and develop into adults. Um, but for the mice, sometimes these result in unviable animals. So that either they are um, you know they don't develop fully in utero or they die very shortly after birth. But we do have the ability to generate um, conditional mutations and the FAM um, structure itself would be very conducive to generating a conditional model. So we have a lot of cool little tricks and um, I think I mentioned him, but Amir is uh, the fellow in um, Steve Murray's group and he is uh, quite the wizard when it comes to new genetic uh, approaches to making conditional systems. But right now we don't have um, a conditional thing on the on the list, but it's something that may kind of ferment out of what we see from this initial round with our current model. Thank you. And I did see that there was a uh, chat question, which is a very good one, regarding whether or not the FEV strain is blind, which is actually a good catch. 
So FEB does have another background mutation in it that leads to retinal degeneration in the animals right around wean age, which is around four weeks. Now, this would be a problem for us since, again, a lot of the behavioral assays are very contingent on the animals being able to see. So we are already basically doing a little sidestep around this problem in that there is a strain of FEB that has a correction for that retinal degeneration issue which we are currently, or concurrently, I might say, while we are finishing up our, uh, our breeding statistics on these animals, crossing the animals into, in order to prevent them from having that retinal generation issue. So when we actually go into the stage of doing all the phenotyping, we'll have um, animals who have a full range of vision and we'll be keeping it for the majority, or until they're at least very, very, very old. So thank you for asking that very good question.